Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's You Talk, which is about AI in business and how we're building lasting customer relations through AI. We're joined today with our partners, um, Affinity. My name is Frances Martin. I am the VP of Operations and Enablement, and I am going to be your host today for this You Talk. So You Talks is our monthly speaker series, which is brought to you by Optus U. Through You Talks, we will host some incredible thought leaders, some inspiring professionals and capability experts on all things future and skill set development. But before I start, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands of which we virtually meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. This you talk Connect, uh, this you talk today is about the connection to AI and why this exciting new emerging technology is one of the most fascinating in actually achieving companies' new vision and strategy moving forward. Um, as I said, we are joined by our partner Affinity and I'd just like to welcome our panellists here today. First of all, I think you would all be uh, familiar with Faisal Kalau, who is our Head of Digital Sales. Um, and he's, I'm sure, a very familiar face uh, for many of you as well. Sitting next to me, I have White Roy, who is the General Manager of Affinity. Prior to joining Affinity, White served in the Australian House of Representatives and as Australia's First Minister for Innovation. At the age of 20, he was the youngest person elected to the Australian Parliament. And at 25, he was the youngest minister in the history of the Commonwealth. So I really kind of feel like I'm in the presence of greatness today. <laughs> <laughs> Just carry it over there. Richard Brodenstein, uh, former CEO of Foxtel until April 2016. Uh, at, prior to this, Richard was also CEO of News Digital Media and the Australian newspaper and was the Chief Operating Officer of British Sky Broadcasting. <laughs> Richard is currently a non-executive director of the RE Group and uh, director of Coles uh, Group as well. Uh, Cricket Australia, one owner in the school. Um, he's also the Deputy Chancellor and Fellow of the Senate of the University of Sydney. So welcome, Richard. Thanks, Grace. And finally, I'd like to uh, introduce Caroline O'Brien. Uh, Caroline is uh, the Senior Vice President of Data Science at Affinity. Prior to joining Affinity, Caroline was a postdoctorate fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Biomedical and Medical Engineering for the University of New South Wales and a Bachelor's of Engineering and Science with majors in Mechanical and Space Engineering and Mathematics from the University of Queensland. That is uh, quite a portfolio already. <laughs> Caroline is an active research affiliate at the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences, using principles of engineering, mathematics and machine learning, image processing and computer vision techniques to understand, diagnose and treat cardiovascular disease. Um, so I'm going to start off today's uh, discussion and uh, with Caroline. Um, we really, today we really actually want to demystify what AI is and I'm really trying to build, um, you know, understand how we can actually use it, uh, you know, in our businesses and what the broader implications of it. And just for our people actually on the call, I really encourage you to post your questions and also as we're going through this, really think about how could you actually use AI in your area of the business? So Caroline, over to you. Thanks, Francis. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes doing a very high level um, what is AI and hopefully bring it to life a little bit. And as Francis said, demystify uh, AI so that we can understand it and understand its use cases. So let's start with the definition of AI. So this uh, this definition came from um, our CEO of, at Affinity, Zia Chissi, a very intelligent man, man, but also a very practical man. He said, AI is quite simply finding patterns in complex data sets at a level that approximates human intelligence. So artificial intelligence is not a big scary thing. It is really just trying to find uh, a system or a machine that can replicate humans' uh, ability to think and make decisions. I'll flip to the next slide, please. So what is an artificially intelligent agent? So that's what is an artificially intelligent machine or computer or more broadly a system? Well, it has two key components, and I'm, I'm borrowing this from Professor uh, Andrew Moore from Carnegie Mellon, 
but he conceptualizes this in, in two mm -hmm. ways. It has an understanding component and a decision making component. Understanding is about learning. So learning from uh, data, learning quite simply from rules. So how do we make a, uh, a, an agent, a machine, um, make uh, intelligent decisions on par with, with human intelligence? Well, we need to be able to have an ability to learn. Learning could be simple rules or in more complex decision making systems, it uh, requires more complex or sophisticated approaches. And that's uh, more recently, we've, we've explored this area of machine learning to support AI agents. Machine learning is, uh, is learning through data and learning through examples. And so the most, the most uh, subcategory of machine learning and the one that we're most familiar with is, is supervised learning. Supervised learning is where we give the machine examples of success and failure, and then using algorithms, try to learn how to replicate success and avoid failure. Once we've trained that machine, um, we then want to be able to perceive it. So given what we've just learned, when presented with new information, how do we perceive the likely outcome? Uh, so that's the perception or the prediction layer of our understanding. And then once we've, we've, we've got a machine that understands and can perceive, they've got to then take action. So there's a decision making component. So that means either automating a process Augmentations, that means changing a process or changing a decision that we uh, from how we would have normally done it or optimize it. So that means choosing between multiple decisions. That's very high level, but what I thought I'd do today was bring it to life with an example. So if we can flick to the next slide, um, we are going to walk through a smart tagging uh, algorithm, uh, AI technology, sorry, that you would normally see on your iPhone. So this might be a uh, an album that you've got on your on your on your iPhone that uh, is dedicated to a uh, a person in you know your uh, in your family network. In my case, I'm trying to create an album for my son Cormac. Cormac is my second son. Um, I'm going to do that from the library of photos that I have. So the first thing I'm going to do in building that uh, in in building that AI tool is I'm going to teach it. So I'm going to present data to this tool. We flick to the next slide. Specifically, I'm going to give it what we call label data. So that means this is how I'm going to train my model, my tra train my machine learning model. I'm going to present it with data where I've already said this is Cormac, this is not Cormac. So if you're familiar with the tool um, on your Apple iPhone, you'll see this, uh, this feature that comes up. And so they'll try and get you to try and they'll prompt you to tag that person and declare whether or not that's Cormac or not. So in this case here, Cormac's my second son. He's the one with the red glasses there. And I'm going to say whether or not that's Cormac that's been highlighted or not. As you can see the image behind him, that's my other son, Tom. Tom's pretending to wear glasses, but <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite confusing. And, and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to present the, uh, the, the tool with as many photos of Cormac and not Cormac to train him. The key here is variability. We want to make sure, so if you want to make your your smart tagging algorithm as powerful as possible. Don't present it with the same image of Cormac over and over again. You want to give him images that might confuse him, but declare it either successful or not. So in this case, Cormac or not. That's the process of labeling. So it's rather manual, that one. But now that we've got the label data, we can then now play the algorithms. So that's the next slide, please. In image classification, state-of-the-art algorithm are neural nets. So that's what underlies, you'll hear deep learning, but neural networks, which are, or in this, in this particular example, convolutional neural networks, which is a suite of algorithms that are trying to replicate how our cognitive function works. Um, these have been developed over the last 15 years, um, and they're very, very powerful tools in the um, area of image classification. There are lots of algorithms uh, available depending on what the use case is. These you know, uh, neural nets are particularly relevant here, but may not be relevant in another use case. Uh, flick to the next slide, please. So we've now completed the, the learning phase. We're now at the perception phase. So this is given what we've learned and the, how we've taught the, uh, the machine, we've trained the model, now we need to go and perceive it. So this is an, uh, so going through an unlabeled data set. So this is in the background. Um, without humans, this is what your, uh, your smart uh, tagging tool will be doing. It will be going through all your images on your phone and it will be trying to predict whether or not that's Cormac or not. Um, in this case, 
there are going to be photos which present a lot like Cormac, given the features and um, given our training set, and ones that are going to be kind of like him, but not there. So that's how you get the misclassifications that you'll see, because it's been trained poorly, or perhaps the algorithm isn't that powerful. So we're now at the perception layer. Now we can go into the action, uh, action phase, which is the decision making. So next slide, please. So this is the process of going through all of your photos and tagging them as Cormac or not Cormac. And then you end up with this album dedicated to, uh, in this case, my second son, Cormac. Um, and so that's, that's I'm trying to bring AI to life, but critically here, it's not just about the image yeah. classification, it's the process of automatically tagging all of those images. So there's an understanding layer and a, a decision-making layer as well. Flick to the next slide, please. So I will I'll quickly touch on where we are in terms of AI. So AI has had huge successes, but there's still a long way to go. Right now, most applications mm -hmm. are in what we call narrow intelligence. That means um, uh, where the, the, the machine has been trained on a single task and it performs that task very well. That's called task oriented intelligence. And most of those use cases are like uh, predictive diagnostics and image tagging that you're seeing there. That's really about mastering one task. What it can't do though is it can't take what it learned on one task and transfer it to the next task. That's called generalized intelligence. That's that transfer of information from one to the other. So they can't machine can't take what it learned on chess and apply it to the game of Go. Even though they're similar in terms of strategies, you can't you can't transfer that. And that's what really <coughs> differentiates us uh, humans and machines at this point. So general intelligence is we are capable of getting there. We're still far away though. And if you subscribe to the singularity view of the world it's about a decade off and it's not because we don't have the hardware we've got the machines that could make those decision decisions and computations but we just don't have the software the algorithms are lacking they're only growing at a linear rate while our computers are growing at an exponential rate so that's where that gap is in enabling that generalized intelligence the next layer is what everyone i think is scared of is this super intelligence which you can be well assured we are far off and superintelligence where the machine is become smarter than the human. And I, I can um, categorically say we are very far off that uh, at the moment. That's not to say though, there aren't some wonderful success stories. So if we can flick to the last slide here, narrow, narrow AI is still incredibly impactful. So if we look at the use cases of AI at the moment in businesses, it's fraud detection, promotion, so your next best action can be enhanced through AI, um, behavioural matching, so that's you know, in uh, with Affinity where we're supporting Foxtel and, and we'll learn a little bit about more, but that's in routing technology. And so that's an actual machine to machine decision that we're optimising. So it's not all human replacing humans or replacing human processes. There are machine to machine processes there that can benefit from the efficiencies of AI. Um, the next thing, and probably the most impactful thing that I see, and, and this relates to a lot of my research career, is around medical diagnostics. And so we see, you know, narrow AI can still be applied to things like uh, predicting breast cancer from imaging. Um, we've got, there's my colleagues at, uh, at MIT have recently been able to <coughs> predict breast cancer up to five years in advance. Yeah. So that's off data, which is an extraordinary feat. And, and there's another technology that's just been approved by the FDA uh, called WAVE, which is the patient surveillance technology, which can predict patient deterioration four hours before deterioration. So this is, you know, when you think about heart failure and heart attacks, being able to have six hours to be able to respond means huge, you know, huge benefits in terms of health outcomes for people. So if I will leave you with anything, it is that there are so much to be had from, you know, from AI and, and now <coughs> what, what I consider quite this narrow intelligence, it really just can, it's, it's up to people to be able to identify where those solutions can, can bring benefit. That's amazing. Thank and you, I Chris. think, um, you know, some really powerful examples there. I think for many people, I actually find it quite reassuring that also that the human human interaction with AI is actually still very important. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, there's endless opportunities for actually how we can use AI to make faster, better, uh, more efficient um, decisions that can help our business or um, increase the longevity of life or actually help people potentially change their life to actually avoid, you know, something that may be coming 
um, like breast cancer, you said, predicting the future and really trying to change some behaviour. So um, absolutely fascinating. And, and I think the topic just gets more and more exciting the more that you look into it. Um, Faisal, I'm going to throw it uh, to you now. So um, now that we know what AI is, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what we're doing with Affinity, um, how we're practically using it in the business, and what are we doing differently now than we were before, and then what do the results look like? Yeah, excellent. Look, first, thank you, Caroline. That was a great um, uh, coverage of what AI is and what AI isn't. And if I, um, what I want to cover now is really about who is Affinity and how did we end up partnering with an, an AI business in you know, a traditional contact center that is telesales. Before I get into that, so I just sort of quickly cover off the transformation journey that telesales has been on to give broader context on how we ended up partnering with Affinity. So the last three years, we've radically transformed our um, telesales contact center businesses from being a spread of onshore and offshore. We've completely uh, transformed and transitioned our, our contact centers into Australia, primarily in Adelaide, Sydney and Melbourne. Um, what we've also done is, what we've also seen is a, is a significant shift back into voice from a customer behaviour with the proliferation of, you know, your Google Homes, your Alexas, and customers now do want to talk to, continue want to talk to humans when, you know, if you looked at it three, four years ago, you know, people were predicting, you know, it's all going to go digital or back in the stores, et cetera. So the, our contact centre is not just in, 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 um, in telecommunications, but more broadly, it had a, a, a resurgence. And, and it's obviously come to life over the last 12 months through COVID. So um, what that's meant is we've transformed in three key areas, and that's been our customer experience has, you know, we're sort of, you know, top best seller now in the mid 70s. Our conversion rates have tripled and our people engagement is, you know, in the high 70s. So I think it's, we've transformed. So, but as you know, when we come in, we, we want to be world class and we want to become Australia's most loved everyday brand and build cast, last, lasting customer relationships. So when we looked at, okay, how can we innovate in our contact centre business? As you know, it's a traditional customers call in, they speak to a, you know, a well-trained, well-coached uh, agent, and hopefully we provide a great experience and deliver a, a value outcome for both customer and, and Optus. And partnering with Affinity, we, we challenged our traditional model. So um, uh, Carolyn touched on behavioural pairing and the, the technology that Affinity brings in into a contact centre environment, it takes, uh, it breaks the traditional routing model, which basically means if I'm first in the queue, I will get assigned to the first telesales agent um, as soon as they become available. So if there's 10 people in the queue, sequentially they will get assigned to the next 10 people that come off, that become available. What uh, the Affinity AI does, it takes a, a whole bunch of data points that we know about our telesales agents. It also takes a whole bunch of data points that we know about customers. And it uses those many data points and continuously learns, as Caroline explained earlier, to start behaviorally matching um, a customer with an agent that are likely to have a better relationship. So it's not about likely to convert more sales or anything like that. It's actually likely to better, just to you know, you know, kick it off and have a great conversation and a better relationship. So as with anything in life, you, you get along more with certain individuals that you then then you don't and uh, it's no different to uh, our no different to our everyday interactions so we're util utilizing that uh, affinity's AI technology to test and innovate into our routing um, routing into telesales so um, what we've um, what we've our objective of doing this is, is threefold and it aligns with the, obviously our overall our purpose is to provide a great customer experience and continue providing great customer experience, to build customer lifetime value, and also just make it not not only make it a great experience for customers but also for our people as well. So it's really just looking how do we continue growing the engagement and capability of our people, but also continue providing a world class experience and value for for our customers. So um, you know and. You know, people keep asking me, how do you know if this thing is working? It's, it's pretty out there technology. And and the, the great news is, is that it's actually precisely measurable. So it cycles on and off, on and off. And we know when the AI is not on, we know what our baseline is. And when the AI is on, we know what our incremental or our, our negatives are. And, and you can see quite clearly, both from an incremental volume perspective, but also from a value perspective, uh, and this is across all our range of products, how it's working. And then we have... Um, obviously, uh, a model with with affinity that 
we can then, um, and we work with Carolyn and a data science team to say, okay, we want to tweak the AI to drive um, a better outcome in, uh, let's call it uh, connected devices, or we want to drive a, a greater share of, um, you know, plans from from X to Y. It could be it could be whatever um, that could be customer experience related, or it could be business related as well. So it's not a set and forget. It continually evolves on its own, but we've obviously got. Um, strong working relationship with Affinity through Francis's team, obviously through the Affinity team. Um, and this is an Australian first, so really, really exciting uh, technology. And um, to answer your question, Francis, how it's going, so far I would deem it a success, you know, so it's actually um, demonstrating value growth and it's demonstrating uh, customer experience improvements as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think, you know, we talk about building trusted relationships and this is almost really matching um, our agents with our customers. So really kind of, you know, um, matching them up with someone that they actually think they're going to have the best possible conversation with it. So it's a bit like dating. Really. <laughs> yes. Perhaps more successfully. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so Richard, I'm just going to turn my attention to you now. Um, so you're on the board of two of Australia's largest companies, Re and, and the Coles Group, and you've also had a very long and successful career in business. How do you think businesses can actually distinguish between what's real AI and you know tangible value, and and avoid that kind of you know hype and buzz about actually we're just doing AI, um, so that it's tangibly delivering results? It's really good point, Francis. There's a lot of buzz around AI and data and things like that, and I think you've got to start and, and the businesses I'm working with start from the proposition of what is the business opportunity or what is the business problem that I'm trying to solve, and then you can use AI to help you solve that business problem. But you've got to start with being very clear about what you want to get out of what you're trying to achieve. And we look at it in, in, in mainly two ways. How can it create a better, how can AI help create a better customer experience and therefore drive revenue? Or how can AI help us save money and therefore create more efficiency in the business? And in a perfect world, you'll have um, an AI um, system that does both. So, and if you can do that, and if you're very clear on what the objective is, the AI can enhance how you're going to get there. So one example in Coles, forecasting 10 years ago used to be a pretty blunt tool. Mm. You know, what are we going to put on shelves tomorrow? Well, what did we sell this time last year? What did we sell this time last week? Go from there. You can imagine now with all the data sets available through things like flybys, um, plus other data sets you can put in, you can be much more sophisticated about on a store by store basis, um, what demographic came into the store yesterday? What did they buy? What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? And all these other data inputs to mean you can have a much more sophisticated view of what you need to put on the shelves. And similarly with something like markdowns, you know, if something's about to expire, you normally drop the price. And that used to be done in a very blunt way as well, you know, X amount of time before it expires, you drop the price. Now using all this uh, AI and the data that's coming in, you can be much more sophisticated about when you drop the price, when you don't drop the price. And when you're doing 20 million transactions a week, every dollar saved or Makes a big difference. Uh, that's amazing because um, one, you're driving, um, you know, obviously greater productivity. Two, you can actually get a Coles probably more personalised to what the needs and demands of that area. Absolutely. And then you're reducing your waste, which, Absolutely. you know, as any organisation really wants to drive that through. Yeah. And actually, we did have um, a question from uh, Shane who was actually uh, asking, um, out of curiosity, how are we measuring some of these technologies? Um, and you know, what are the relationships by this tech? And I think there's some really great examples about it could be cost out, it could be actually driving higher revenue, it could actually you know, be driving much more efficiency and much more personalization to the customers as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point that by the way, measuring is really, really important. And, <laughs> and, and the way the affinity relationship works with Optus, because it's turned on and off, you have absolute real yes. measurement. 100%. Hour by hour, month by month, however you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. so, and, you know, as um, as we know, you know, we turn it off for like 30 minutes and we can actually see, um, you know, the results in that thing, or we have different cohorts and we can see the difference in performance. So, yeah. uh, very easy to manage and, um, and look at, you know, what are the different groups and how they're driving different results. Moving on from that then, um, what do you think a business needs to look at when they're implementing their AI strategy? I think, again, it comes back, you've got to start, you start with what you want to achieve and then you start with um, the data. You know, how, how good is the quality of the data that I've got already? What other data inputs do you think we need to actually help, you know, as Caro talked about, how do you feed the, 
for the AI machine? What data do you need to bring into it to allow the machine to learn more to be able to help you achieve your outcome? I think the, so the data is a very, very important part of it. Then I think when you're starting an AI project, I think you've got to go through that classic buy or build discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, do I have the, the um, resources in house to do this? Is it is the best use of their time? Will I be building something bespoke that doesn't build on world best technology? Or do I partner with someone who brings the world best technology and can get to market quicker and hopefully more efficient? So that, that buy or build thing, I think is something you have to think about very, very early on and work out. Do I do it myself or do I partner with world's best practice? Yeah, and I think because it is an emerging technology, you may not necessarily have all those skill sets in exactly. house. Um, and it's great to draw on the practical experience of what other countries um, or companies around the world that might be actually doing. Exactly. I think, Francis, too, when you do that, you free up your other resources and do more things as well. I mean, there's always an opportunity cost for a business about how much time and energy do I put into this thing? Or if I don't put that energy by partnering with someone, I can apply that to the 10 other things we've got to achieve. So there's a real benefit sometimes in, in grabbing, you know, a smart group of people from somewhere and bringing them into your organisation. 100%. I mean, I think growth mindset doesn't come from looking inwards. It actually comes from looking outwards. Exactly. So, um, you know, we have to be able to leverage, you know, what we see as being out there. So once you've, um, once you've found the opportunity internally, how does an organisation then drive that value across the vertical so um, so that they're actually executing to it? Yeah, it's it's that's really interesting. I mean, you've got to you've got to remember that this uses a lot of technology. So the IT group are a very very important component of, of this, but it's a business problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So who is the business owner? Who has responsibility for it? I think that needs to be really clearly identified. Really clearly identify what you're trying to do, what are your targets, what are your measures, how are you going to get there, and then I think project management. You know, yeah. the, more, the more time I spend in business, the more project management becomes more and more important. You see how important having good people to run projects is. So I think it, it's a it's a fundamental, you know, how do you drive how do you drive business performance? Yeah, I think to build on that, I mean, if you look at the way we've implemented Affinity into Optus, it's owned by myself and Francis, and we're not in IT. Obviously, we're working closely with IT. Um, to your point, Richard, it's not owned by IT, it's owned by the business. It's because uh, we're trying to solve a business outcome. Yeah, and 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 a customer need because yeah. you know from from us, it's actually about um, doing everything to become you know the most loved brand and you know building these trusted relationships. So their problems owned by the business, not by uh, you know people running the system in the back end. Yeah. Um, but cohesively um, to achieve the goal, we all need to you know work together to be able to do it. Absolutely. Right, I'm going to spin to you now. Sure. You're Minister of Innovation, so yep. you've got all the answers, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> People don't talk about Canberra that way very often, <laughs> so I'm glad you said that. Uh, yes, we'll all live that one. Um, what do you see, you know, what role do you think the government needs to play in this um, in both advancing, you know, research and development into AI? Um, and, and what's their responsibility about, you know, transparency of, you know, the social, legal, ethical yeah. implications of AI, you know, because if not managed effectively, you know, this can actually, what can be a real success story can actually, you know, really um, pivot against the company and be, you know, um, quite negative yeah. um, towards their brand. Yeah, they're, they're two great questions. I think um, on your first one, of what is the role of the government to support AI? And I would also just say, how does the government help the country seize the opportunities of technology disruption? You know, in every element of our life, technology is changing it. People can either see that as a threat or an opportunity. And I think as a country, if we see that as an opportunity when we can really drive effectively a better society to hand on to the next generation. And if you think about the country, we've gone through you know, until COVID, over a quarter of a century of uninterrupted economic growth. I mean, that is completely remarkable by global standards. It was driven by a lot of things, but really it was driven by, uh, we have stuff in the ground that we want to dig up and sell to people who live near us. And we have a great sort of farming culture as well. And that's a great story for our country. You know, my family are farmers and miners, that's great. But if we're going to hand on to the next generation of Australians, a country that has more opportunity, not less, then we do have to diversify the economy uh, and really drive these new industries to create the new jobs and new economic growth that we have. The question then is, well, what is the role of the government? And, you know, I often believe the government's role is to facilitate a framework that allows the private sector to thrive and to drive and to do these sorts of things. So wherever possible, we need to be playing to our strengths. Um, we need to attract capital into this country to invest mm -hmm. in these things. So before I was the minister, there was $200 million invested in venture capital into sort of these technologies in Australia. We bet more on the Melbourne Cup 
uh, in the last quarter, there was several billion dollars invested. Uh, and that was done through changing tax laws to drive that capital investment to create those opportunities. We need to change our culture. You know, the government has allowed microphone to talk from. We're very risk adverse as Australians in many cases. These technologies inherently because they new carry some risk. And so we want to support a risk culture, an entrepreneurial culture, people who develop these kinds of technologies. The government has powerful levers to drive collaboration between uh, industry, uh, academia, uh, and the government to commercialize these technologies and bring them to market. And, you know, traditionally as a country, we do really great research. Uh, we're in one of the top ranking OECD ranks for research and one of the lowest for commercialization. So trying to get companies to partner with that research, that academia, to translate that technology into real businesses, real jobs. I think the government could play a big part. So there's a number of levers that we need to pull, but it's really facilitating that and playing to our strengths. I mean, think about us as a country. Uh, we are a lifestyle superpower. People, and COVID kind of shows this, right? People from across the world want to move here. And so Cara and I, yesterday, we, we, we was interviewing a uh, someone who's 32, has a PhD from uh, Oxford in mathematics, could work anywhere in the world. Uh, but wanted to work here, work with Affinity uh, because of the lifestyle elements that come with it, at least in part. And I think that's a great strength we should play to. We sit in Asia where there's a billion people coming into the middle class. They want to buy technologies and services from here. And Australia can really act as a beachhead into that Asian marketplace. I mean, even for the Affinity sense, you know, a multi-billion dollar global AI company, our biggest presence in APAC or in Asia is here. Uh, and that allows us to have a beachhead into here. Most of the people in our office have APAC roles. So the government facilitating uh, an environment that plays to those strengths is really, really, really key. Uh, to your point about the ethical, moral kind of questions, the really big thing here is uh, the government, and I would say particularly the regulators, particularly around AI, have to sit in the room with the industry. Uh, wherever you have people from industry not sitting in the room together when they're creating those rules and regulations as this technology grows, you can see real problems kind of happen. And there's been some great examples. I mean, even this week with the uh, the, the media rules that have been played out, uh, one of the things that I think led to a lot of that tension was the regulators, the government and the industry weren't sitting in the room together when they were creating those laws. And uh, you, you can also see it uh, uh, recently, a lot of those media companies uh, and tech companies um, gave evidence before Congress in the US. And you had senators and Congress people answering questions with no idea what they were actually sort of talking about. And so there is a real, I think, imperative to put those two people in a room together. Um, I'll give you a really practical example. Uh, when I became the minister, I set up a, what I call a policy hackathon. So hackathons are very techy kind of thing. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, it wasn't without controversy, but it worked incredibly well. So the idea of a hackathon, we had 10 policy objectives. Uh, we created 10 teams. Those teams would be half of people from industry, half of people from uh, the, the sort of public service, senior public servants. Uh, we had a policy objective of how do we improve STEM education for young Australians so that they've got the skill set to get the jobs in the future. We all kind of agree on that. People in industry would say, oh, we'll just change the curriculum. Well, the curriculum kind of exists. And when I, when I was in a room with a public servant who would turn around and say to someone from industry, well, in order to do that, you'd have to go to COAG, you'd have to go to a state government, it would take five years. They were then able to step back and say, OK, well, how do we walk around that problem? Rather than, you know, empowering a, a teacher to teach coding to a student who, uh, you know, frankly, the student probably knows more than the teacher. Why don't we get people from industry, you know, your Googles, your Facebooks, mm. whatever it might be, get them to teach effectively their future employees and the government can throw resources at that. If you didn't have people from industry and government in the room together, you never would have solved that problem that way. And I think as we deal with the ethical, moral, you know, regulatory challenges, You've got to put people in the room together to deal with that because otherwise, you have people who don't understand it, creating laws around it, and that's inevitably going to lead to bad outcomes. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, you know, I know Faisal and my team have actually discussed, even as um, Optus goes down this, this journey about bringing in AI, how do we set ourselves up so that, um, you know, that we can leverage these opportunities at scale? And it absolutely has to be across functional and across business mm -hmm. journey together about, you know, building trust, building the right uh, risk, building the right, you know, um, frameworks around it so that we can actually leverage it and, yeah. you know, making sure that we're constantly monitoring it. Well, Francis, two point two, it's great that you and Faisal are doing that because leadership is so important in this, you know, giving an organisation the focus and the flexibility to actually tackle these challenges because 
often, particularly in large organisations, government or private industry, the easiest thing is to do nothing. Yeah. Uh, the easiest thing is to actually sit there and just let the status quo maintain. But if the leadership says, this matters, we're focused on it, and I'm going to give my team the flexibility to tackle it, that's how you do it. And, and you know, to see that here is really exciting. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's the thing that we're trying to do with Optus U as well. So we want to build um, the capability internally so that one, that actually um, our own teams have the capacity to recognise opportunities in the business because they're working in the business. And, you know, as leaders, we don't necessarily see all those opportunities. So the ability to be able to recognise and then do something about it and feel empowered that you can actually, you know, create this exciting new future, I think is actually, um, you know, something very exciting that's something to look forward to. Um, and, you know, and I think Australia's role in this innovation piece, and, you know, it is interesting, we have such great research, but, you know, I constantly see, um, you know, people having to go overseas to get external funding. So we're losing a lot of our entrepreneurials or, or key talent. So bringing them, making them, you know, come here to Australia and becoming a destination for other countries to come here and do that, I think is actually something that's really going to help secure our future as well. Um, so uh, anyone can answer this. So um, at Optus, we're focused on driving lasting customer relationships. What do you see the role of AI and the, in the con and the context and in supporting that strategy? And are they, what's it going to do for our customers? And have you seen, have, like, what are the risks that we're exposing to, you know? We, we want to make sure that we're preserving, you know, those rights and the privacy and everything of the customers. Are we doing enough to manage that, yeah. what you've seen? Well, I might kick off and then jump, jump in. I think the very first thing is really at its core, what all of this is about is giving the customer a better experience. And when we say a better experience, what we really mean is a more personalised experience. And I think that's kind of the transition that we're yeah. seeing from, you know, Faze, you must have seen this in the business so many times where you've gone from a more old world view of how do we give a more general experience to somebody and then personalise that more and more over time. And technology is really, I think, enabling that personalised experience. I mean, you know, what's your kind of view on how you kind of transition to that point? Yeah, I think, yeah, 100%. So whether it's digital personalisation all the way from marketing through to what that digital experience looks like to our retail and contact centres and really curating and building the capability of our people, but also our digital platforms to enable that personalised experience. Because to your point, um, once you do have a personalised experience, you will engage with that brand value or, or the individual. Um, and Ultimately, it's just going to lead to a better outcome for both customer and Optus. Yeah, exactly right. And then I think on your your data point, Francis, that may carry a better insight than me on this. But uh, one of the things that you know Richard was talking about is you have all of this data that's sitting there, and so the first step in this transformation journey is getting access to that data. There's this you know cliche saying that data is the new oil. Um, you know, we just need to kind of tap it. And so the first step is sort of building you know the well to go down and get it. But then the question is, well, what is the use cases for that? And when the business has an intuitive understanding of, hey, these are the business outcomes mm -hmm. we want to achieve, how do we use the data to get there? Then the questions around security and privacy become much easier to kind of deal with because you're like, if I use you know, this data set for marketing, well, then using it to give a customer a better experience in the contact centre, you're actually dealing with the same sorts of issues and mm -hmm. the same sorts of regulations. So I think actually taking a very common sense, practical understanding, the business understanding to data rather than a purely technical one, helps actually set up the framework that you need to address this in the right way. Yeah, and Caroline, you mentioned things like fraud detection, you know, ID theft and all those things. You know, we can really start to manage that as well. Um, you know, our CEO, KBR, you know, certainly, you know, there was an article yesterday, she was talking about, you know, how we can really use data to actually drive ourselves out of COVID. Um, and, you know, as a telco, we actually, we sit on a lot yeah. of data as well. So, um, I think that you know there's a huge opportunity for really for us to think about these kind of business cases um, and leverage all that data to kind of get through it. But just with that, um, what cultural attributes do you think you know? Because we got we got the oil, we have just got to work out what we're going to do with it. So, what are the cultural attributes do you think that you know an organisation like Optus needs to drive across their business in order to be able to leverage that? I mean, I might start with two and then Richard, I'd be interested to get your view on this, but I think there's um, the, the first I would say is actually a an appetite or a risk or an understanding that there might be failure along the way. And you do actually need that kind of culture because if you, in any kind of technology transformation, you go from a point where you have an old set of technology and you go to a new set of technology, there will be a bit of a valley of death in that. That's just reality. And if you empower your team 
and mm. particularly when you're working with partners, if you have the trust that uh, we are joint partners and we will work through that valley of death together uh, and give people kind of the flexibility and ability to do that. Valley of hope. I'm gonna valley of hope. <laughs> <laughs> I like that line. I'm going to steal that line. I think um, giving people that flexibility to do that. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to fail, fail fast. I mean, that's really, really important yeah. as well. That cultural mindset, I think, is absolutely kind of key. And then you do, again, going back to this leadership point of view, you, you actually mm. need the leadership to say, not just through that journey, but the ability that when it does go wrong, I've got your back. Mm. Um, you know, I was this in government where we were driving when we did the National Innovation Science Agenda, we're driving 24 policies across nine government departments. There was huge inertia from the public service to not want to do stuff because of, you know, it's politics, right? They stuff it up, it's on the front of, front page of the newspaper. And Malcolm, when he was PM, was constantly saying to the public service, you know, when there's a bad news headline, when there's something bad in the media, I've got your back, I'm the PM, I'll, I'll cover it and let's drive forward. And I think if you don't have a leader doing that, then the whole framework is about fear and risk management rather than <laughs> progression. Mm. Um, and uh, and I think, you know, getting the team to kind of think about that uh, in a way where you can give kind of practical example, I mean, give a great example of how he kind of managed this. When we did the, the agenda, uh, the secretary of the department, you know, very successful person, great to work with, been around for a long time, had a very solid risk adverse culture to it. And we'd set up a, a working group. so you know, nine government departments, every week I'd meet with them and try and drive this big agenda through the big bureaucracy of government. And some people would be, you know, no, we're not going to do that. We created a traffic light system of a green policy, a red, uh, an orange one. And obviously the public service put everything at red and I'd come back and put everything at green. And I remember uh, we, were, we had this meeting and this kind of captures the power of leadership where that working group would report up to a subcommittee of cabinet that would approve everything. And I, I went and saw Malcolm before one of those cabinet meetings. And uh, I said, look, here's the 10 things that I really want to get done, but there's inertia, there's you know people who don't want to do it. And uh, he, he said to me, well, give me the list. I'll write it down in order. And in the meeting, he, he sat there, the secretary of the department sat there, and I sat here. And he said, I'm going to uh, basically say we should do these things in this exact order. And he said, you tell the secretary of the department that that's, and it's a little bit cheeky, but you tell the secretary of the department that's how it's going to happen. And so walking to the meeting, the head of the department who had been, you know, had naturally had questions around this stuff. Uh, I'd say, we really need to do this. And I said, just so you know, the PM is going to say it in this exact order. And I want you to know he's got our back and he wants us to progress. And of course, that played out in the meeting. And after that, the entire culture changed yeah, because amazing. they were completely like, OK, we get it now. We're willing to take that risk. And I think, you know, to your point about that culture, if it comes from the top of hey, we're prepared to really do this and we've got you back on it, that's the best thing you can do for the organisation. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, leadership is actually paramount in this and, and giving people the permission to um, make a mistake, you know, pivot yeah. and learn from it, I think is just so empowering and it re removes that fear yeah. of, that people have. And, you know, when you're moving into emerging technologies, you know, we don't have all the answers. So we are going into <laughs> the unknown. So we've, you know, we've got a... Um, look at that. So, so I'm just, yeah, just, I, yeah. I, I, so I think you're exactly right. And just the, the, the only other thing which sort of is the same is that, that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. feeling that people, I'm not going to do exactly what I did every day for the past five years. I'm going to think about what we're trying to achieve here and I'm going to add <laughs> value by, by thinking about it and thinking about how I can add value rather than just doing my, my day job. Yeah, and, and you know, as we discussed before, people working in the business often see things that we don't yeah. see as leaders. and. And if you're trying to address, you know, the customer pain points, they're feeling and experience of those things as well. So yeah. it does create, you need a whole organisation to be anchored around this and, and how we're going to solve the problems. Now, we've got we've got a lot of questions, so right. I'm going to flip to some of the questions and then I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to come back and uh, ask you for, you know, one last question to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, and everyone online, if we don't get to all your questions, uh, please uh, know that we will put it up onto Yammer and we'll come back with all the responses. So, uh, first of all, uh, Faisal, I'm going to take the first one to you. So, congratulations, Faisal and team, on your ongoing success. Uh, question, what are the key success measures used to understand the impact Affinity is having in the sales team? Um, is it customer time, increased mm -hmm. conversion? I think we've touched on some of these, but maybe um, you just want to touch on those again? Yeah, that's a great question. So the the, the, the three key metrics that we track are uh, NPS, so TMDS, touchpoint NPS, 
we track uh, incremental, obviously, conversion, so sales, but also the value of those sales. So it's no good that the AI is helping us make sales, but they're actually lower value than what our normal baseline is. So um, at a very simplistic level, it's really about growing value and experience. Yeah, I think it's a really great point, right? We're trying to drive the absolute most amount of value for the business. And because our business models, we actually revenue share what we create, both you and I are extremely aligned yeah. on how do we drive the absolute biggest benefit to the bottom line through a, a CLB type metric. And I think Absolutely. that's really key. Yeah. And actually, we've got an interesting one from um, Shane Brown, who is actually a telesales agent. He said he's all for having a good chat. The kicking off a good convo seems like something that would actually be hard to measure. How can these two work together? Why don't you talk about how we measure it? This is yeah. quite interesting. So we look at we look at anything that we can measure um, in the contact centre. So contact centres is, is, is quite a rich place to collect data. So that's one of the reasons why our technology could deploy there, right? We could we could do this in retail channels, but retail, you know, hasn't been, you know, we, ha we haven't been as impactful there because it's hard to measure as many, you know, the measure the data points. And those data points feed the, the feed the algorithms. Having said that, we are we are in retail, but just uh, not here yet, not at Optus yet. Um, but the in the contact center, what we're doing is we're measuring. So things like handle times, uh, we're looking at your performance over the track that the day we're trying to look at individual agent performance relative to how they're performing on subsequent calls. So we look at sales outcomes. We look at um, CSAT, MPS um, in some of our, uh, depending on what, you know, what other, I'm talking broadly across our, our client base. Um, we can also measure things um, like, um, uh, what's one of the, so in so in our in Optus at the moment we've got a uh, a solution that is uh, deployed like we cycle on and off so during the day so what we can look at is how your how your working and, and efficiency is is measuring through the day we're looking at during COVID times as well so we're looking at the impact of working from home um, or any of the uh, the changes to the environment so anything related to that we can also look at the individual performance on different customer segments and that's what we're trying to get down to is the interaction level yep. so not just looking on average performances we're looking at how you're performing relative um to the customers as well so we're trying to narrow narrow it right down to the interaction level so it's really amplifying that and also you know a good chat can become a great chat because you've actually used the data yeah to right. make yep. sure the people are actually aligned yeah no i really like that um, there's a couple of questions around this, and this one's um, from Rich Harb, and I, hopefully I've um, pronounced that correctly. Does Affinity have any user cases of AI in supply chain and logistics that uh, you could actually do? Yeah, uh, so we, we do, we do, we have we have truck roles. I kind of I touched on that. That's one where we where it's a customer service in the field, so trying to optimize the um, allocation of of service vehicles to locations. Um, any type of case assignment so that could be an assignment of an agent an assignment of a task to uh, to an agent and that's what that's where our optimization works so we look at um so anything anything to do with uh like so in collections environment it might be case management um is another one that we do uh we can do offline pairings as well so we have a solution in a healthcare provider where we're uh in in the uh in the us where we're pairing nurses with uh with agents and uh, the optimization is trying to book appointments and uh, and, and measure adherence rates mm -hmm. so it's an interesting optimization so anything where there you is can a, always yeah. match them based on you know if you're a specialist in a certain area that yeah, yeah. Know, that they book patient provider that assignment is one we've yeah. got it's kind of if like do, just on that because it's a really interesting kind of example is even just the level of you and i get along well in that case of a nurse to a patient i'm more likely to take my drugs so yeah, the yeah, adherence yeah. rates are going up yeah, I've got the trust in you. exactly yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. even without the qualifications just that personal connection yeah yeah interesting um there's a question here also about how do you address the problem of customers who are apprehensive to interact with a bot look i think we i mean our our approach to this is recognize that some customers have um a different affinity for a different communication channel some prefer to chat to a bot in fact would rather be triaged by a bot than wait in queue yeah. so we see effectively you know like bots being mm -hmm. used um to gather intent and information gathering so that the customer feels confident that they can then be moved on to a to a to the best channel um but 
equally some some we we recognize that some customers don't like interacting with 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 bots and so there isn't actually an ai use case there where you can deflect customers to their channel based on what are their preferences what are their intent and needs right now um and, and in that current interaction so there is so if you, you mean when you think about the applications of ai here you can use ai to get customers to an ai service or you can use AI to move them to a uh, to an assisted channel if they prefer the human interaction. So, you know, it, AI isn't isn't only about bots. It's actually all of the pieces around it to you know to get the best interaction for the customer. Yeah. So it's, it's intelligent routing to what your yeah. preference really needs yeah. to be. Okay. From uh, Michael McDonald, I've got a question. What types of input data does Affinity require to learn about behavioural matching, mm -hmm. and how often is this data refreshed? Great question. So the data sets um, that we look at, and I'll speak broadly, but I think then Faisal can talk about specifically um, here at Optus, but broadly what we're looking at is who is the customer calling in? So we'll look up, you know, we've usually got about 20 milliseconds to respond to a routing request. So in 20 milliseconds, we can gather at Optus of usually about 400 data points, if that if that is a current customer of Optus. Um, those data points include uh, CRM type variables, journey analytics is something we're enhancing and looking towards to include. So how is that customer interacting previous to coming into um, into the Optus Tele sales channel? Um, the intent, so stuff like, so coming from the, like in the, a customer interacting with the IVR. So have they come directly from the IVR? Have they been transferred in from another agent? How have they interacted with the IVR um, before that? Next best action, so PEGA is yeah. used, so have they been um, uh, interacted with an offer before, so that's where the interaction history comes in. That's the type of data that we can usually um, acquire quite quickly uh, about the customer. Okay, great. Um, from Ivana, can you give us some examples of a customer versus a agent data point? Uh, yeah, so uh, on the agent um, side of the equation in the pairing, what we usually use uh, and for the most part is just the outcomes that we're tracking, right? So that's how we characterize the agents. We're not using, um, and we can, and, and in fact, that's the richest data point. What we're trying to build out of them is a behavioral model. So the data that we use, we will pull in lots of, so there's metrics that we talk, touched on there that we're tracking, we'll match them to an agent, and then we're gonna build predictive models on top of that to define how we think the customer is going to behave. Then we put all of that into an optimization framework. So this is where the like suite of algorithms comes into it. Where we and then we make the optimization pair based on our predictive behavior of agent and customer. So there are behavioral models informing both the customer and the agent. They look a bit different. The source system stating is a little bit different, but effectively there it's modeled behavior. Okay, thank you. Um, and this one's from Ian, which is actually about agents. What work has been done looking to use AI to enhance the agent's day environment, particularly around uh, improving, uh, improving the retention of high-performing agents? Well, all agents, I would even say. Yeah. How do you improve the retention? Yeah. Do you want to do that? Do you want, yeah. uh, go to go to Faisal, then I'll, yeah, I'll look, I, I think I think from um, from our perspective and stuff that we're doing around. Um, rolling out our capability programs, whether it's lead uh, and continuous development of, of our people. So I think uh, a technology and an AI um, like Affinity is actually meant to operate subtly in the background. It's not meant to be intrusive. It's not meant to fundamentally change anything. It's just meant to you know, um, you know, operate in the background and all the great stuff that our agents are doing and all the great work we're doing around building capability, that we, the journey that we've been on for the last three years. And then how do we use um, a, a cool tech like this to behaviorally match to to get us an incremental few percent? So I wouldn't uh, right now the way we're employing Affinity, it's not to there there are opportunities, but the way it is right now is to really focus on on the capability of our people. So when we are behaviorally uh, matching to customers, that we continue to maximize those interactions. Oh yeah, and I'll add on that. So the only the the, the way that we deliver benefit is not by making the best agent a little bit better. What we're trying to do is lift the performance of all of the agents. Correct. And so it's because, I mean, really, when we just think about the model itself, it's very hard to lift the performance of the best performing agents because the computer is not as smart as them. They're, they're like, mm. they are going to be your best performing agents no matter what, how we treat them. It's the other agents that, given a better opportunity, could their performance be lifted? And that's what we're testing and that's what we're trying to drive through here. So overall, we should see agent performance lift over, like across the board. And that's where, really where the, the algorithms are really trying to target and ex exploit because that's the easiest way to get the, yeah. the benefit lifts. Yeah. Great. 
and I, this is the last question I'm just going to have, but I think it's actually important because it's actually about a lot of off the shelf recognition systems still have a lot of gender and, and racial bias mm. um, in terms of accuracy. And I think, you know, it's important that we, we look at that. So what do you see is the government, you know, and industry evolving in policy legislation to avoid these scenarios so that actually, you know, that we're building uh, you know, much greater equity. Yeah, it, well, I mean, there's a policy answer to that, but I think there's actually a technology answer to that, which I think you've got a very good sense of yeah. how you remove these biases from our Yeah, mind. I think right now we're in a good space in that we've got explicit ways, there's, there's specific data points that we can and can't use for specific applications. That's well defined. And in fact, when I started my data science career, you know, seven years ago, it wasn't well defined. And now with things like GDPR in the U in the US and sorry, in the UK and then in the, U, uh, the US and Canada, we've now got even more definition on that regulation. We've got um, acts here, the Communication Act, and there's things we, we have definition here about what we can and can't do in terms of profiling customers. So there's ex explicit rules. Add to that, we are, AI has now evolved to a point where it used to be purely predictive. There is an explainability component now that we have to be able to do in, uh, which is regulated part of GDP, GDPR as well. So where the decisions have to be explainable um, to meet the requirements of those of those um, legislation and um, and those uh, and those uh, the regulatory bodies. So the technology providers have to provide that um, as part of their uh, offering, and and that includes anyone else building it internally. Should also you know whenever you're making these technologies, very important to keep an eye on. What is the legislation, uh, you know, across your use case, and how you can and can't use, use data? It should be, you know, built in from the beginning. Yeah, and to build on that, as part of bringing Affinity on, we have to go through a very rigorous, um, you know, government approval process, yeah. exactly, um, to to get this on board. So, um, you know, to back what Caroline has said, it's, um, you know. Yeah, I don't want to go through all the acronyms, but it's been through very, very rigorous, obviously, InfoSec, but also government agency approvals. Yeah, and Optus have a very, um, you know, they have an incredible governance procedure around data usage that's well established. So you've got the structure there to be able to get qu quick information about whether or not your solution is compliant or not, or how to how to make yeah, it compliant. Absolutely. Okay, I'm just going to do rapid fire. So you're the CEO of an organization of an organization. What question are you going to ask in the business you want to drive AI, please? Um, just don't look at AI as your traditional digital channel. So don't think just AI is going to work in online or your app. Um, it can work in all parts of the organisation. So just be a bit more creative and think, how could I use this cool tech to improve either our people's experience or our customers' experience? Great. Richard? If we're going to deploy this AI, how is it going to improve the customer experience? Excellent. Echoing a bit on Faisal because he took my idea, but I will say low, <laughs> low hanging fruit. So look for the yeah. low hanging fruit first. Don't be too ambitious. That's great. Right. I think have a clearly defined use case and make sure that you can measure the results. Excellent. Um, I want to thank everyone for jump, jumping on to our talk today. Um, I could talk about this for hours. I think the opportunity is absolutely endless and it's such a fascinating uh, topic. So thank you. If your question has not been answered, it will be. Um, and keep them coming and obviously this will be posted so people can go back and look at it. Um, thank you so much to our panellists today. Um, deep knowledge in the area and it's great that you can come and share your experience and your knowledge um, and really, you know, spread the word much broader than it is. And face thanks for coming as well. No, well, <laughs> thank you to the two of you for having us. It's been yeah, so great thank to you be very here. much. Great. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.